Hey everybody, welcome on our channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto was the billionaire and got harem with Raven? Part 3. If you are new on the channel, don't forget to subscribe our channel and like the video too. So without wasting any more time. Let's start the story. Robin was happy. He finally got the alone time date he wanted with Starfire, despite he not being the one who originally asked for this outing, and at the moment he was enjoying every second of it, he was ecstatic, and he was excited. He was going to milk this very well-deserved opportunity for all it was worth, and the best part. There was no Naruto round. Robin smiled in content and leaned back on the city sat on. He glanced to his left to spy one quick look at his date, and instantly, he was momentarily stunned at her exotic beauty, and he had to say, he was so damn lucky. Starfire, on the other hand, was upset. She did not dislike spending time with Robin, it was just that Robin was not the one she was looking to spend her outing time with when she had suggested it, when she came up with a suggestion after watching an Earth program which intrigued her, she was secretly hoping that Naruto would be the one with her, however. Robin had surprised her when he had asked her before Naruto ever could, and she could not say no to him. She did not like to make her friend sad. She liked making people happy, especially to those that were her friends, so she could not say no to Robin's offer, despite her wanting dearly to do that very much, and while she would have tolerated this on a normal basis, the one person who her crush had chosen in place of her, made it impossible for her to do so. Her not seeing any sign of them only furthered her bad move until. Hey Star, do you want to ride the Ferris wheel with me and watch the fireworks? Robin asked, hopeful. I can promise you that it'll be fun. Ferris wheel. Starfire worded, with a confused expression written on her face. Please friend Robin, explain to me. What is this so-called wheel of fair is? Is it some sort of strange custom you earth people have? Is it some sort of game? She fired off several questions excitedly. Whoa, whoa, Star, slow down, it's not something to be really worried about. Robin said, as he was waving his hand in a calming motion. There, he thumbed to the ride in question which was a short distance away from the two. That's the Ferris wheel, it's just a fun ride that we can enjoy as much as we want. She saw where Robin had pointed, and for the briefest moment, her heart had suddenly stopped at what her emerald green eyes had spied upon. I believe that while that does look exciting, we should try something else. Starfire suggested, as she turned her head away while trying to burn out the scene she had just spied on. I would even appreciate it more if it was far away from the Ferris wheel. She quietly added. Robin's eyebrow shot up to his hairlines in surprise. Why? What's WR he had started, before stopping in mid-sentence the moment his eyes turned to see what had Starfire so bothered. You know what? You're right. We could try something else. He finished, cheering inwardly at this God-given opportunity, as he caught Starfire's grateful look, which made him give an outward smile, he threw out an alternative solution to his quandary. Starfire did not care what it was, for as long as it took her far away from the spot and the Wheel of Ferris then she was okay, so she given an affirmative nod and followed after Robin, as he lead the way she was unaware that she was about to get a surprise visitor. But the different Titan pair. Raven was the one who now sighed in content with her two eyes closed, while currently garbed in her civilian garb like the rest of the Titans, enjoying Naruto's warmth and personal musk, as she took both in while snuggling in rather intimately into his chest, she didn't care that she was currently perched on his lap at this exact moment, something she wanted to last. Naruto was in a similar position, mentally, as he held Raven's hips with his right hand, exactly why Raven perched herself on him a few moments after they'd begun the ride, he did not know and did not particularly care. He was content and at peace. He was having a good time with his best friend and teammate. Speaking of teammates. Raven, he called her name softly, I'm sorry for working you and the others so hard earlier today. He said to her, looking down at her hologram covered face as he did. I didn't realize I was taking out my issues on you all sooner rather than later. It's alright, she replied her voice just as soft I think we needed the training. Raven said, before looking up at Naruto. We'd messed up and we were caught off guard by a well thought out pan from the enemy, something they used to their advantage, we nearly lost Richard as a result she mumbled out the last part, shuddering at the thought of losing Naruto like they nearly lost a boy wonder. Thank god he had his Titan ID card with him on somewhere that wasn't his utility belt. She mused, glancing up at Naruto. It's a good thing he was smart enough to add the teleportation feature. Please Naruto snorted. That idiot is too stubborn to die from a fall like that. He said, as he was remembering the footage of Richard's particular misstep. Tried to recall just who it was that had taught him Ray, and I think you'll see what I mean. Raven did as she asked and realized that Naruto was indeed right, however this slightly worried her as well, because she seemed to remember it was the same mentor who was amongst the one team who had rejected her cry for help. No, don't think like that. Raven mentally said, shaking her head, as she had unknowingly drawn Naruto's attention. 
Richard and his mentor are two completely different people, what I found has at least told me that much. She thought, remembering how she used her telepathy while she was reading the minds of Richard and some other teammates upon her arrival, she knew that was wrong, but she needed to make sure she was amongst people she could trust. Raven, you're zoning out again. Naruto said, snapping Raven out of her zoning, before a smirk formed on his face. But don't worry, I think it's cute when you do that. He teased. Raven shyly avoided gazing at Naruto's eyes, slapping him in his chest, before she had grumbled out, shut up. Naruto opened his mouth and was about to give a retort, but he stopped and turned serious as multiple square-like spots of different colors and shapes just seemed to flash on the surface of his pupil, after they died down, his right index finger immediately snapped up the minkum in his ear. Ultron, talk to me. He said. Titan satellite has picked up three incoming alien projectiles, all currently breaking through Earth's atmosphere and advancing at speeds of up to 600 km per hour Mr. Senju. Ultron had said to him. Based on my calculations, it seems that their current destination is somewhere around your general location, impact is imminent. Understood Naruto sighed, already picking up the same details Ultron had picked before a blue flash of light surrounded his entire figure in a split second, something which had caused Raven to shield her eyes, and once that light had died down, he now stood boldly and confidently, garbed fully in his new armor, as Arsenal instead of Naruto Senju, he turned to Raven and said to her. And as much as I want to do otherwise, we have to cut all this outing short and put it on hold. Raven sighed in what seemed to be disappointment. She was very upset that her date was rudely interrupted and cut short with no chance of continuing, and she knew exactly just who or what to blame for this inconvenience, and she hoped whatever it was that she and Naruto were about to fight was enough of a tool to allow her to vent her anger. Her hand had reached to her wrist gauntlet and switched off her hologram. Whatever, let's get this over with. She said, missing Naruto's slightly taken back expression as she put on her blue hood attached to her cloak, before she then followed after him as he took off in flight towards the alien projectile, after the blonde had gotten a lock on the drone signal. So did you all get that? Arsenal had asked, speaking via Minkum speakers, as he was shooting through the skies in amazing speeds, with Raven flying right beside him. Yeah, we did. Robin's voice responded through his comm link. Starfire and I remain on ground for standby, just in case Cyborg and Beast Boy aren't able to stop the second drone from reaching the harbor. I already got the lock on the drone signal. Cyborg's voice spoke up from where Robin left off. Beast Boy and I are on our way to intercept, I'll let you know what happened when we do. Good. Arsenal said in response to both Robin and Cyborg's statement. We don't know what the drones are after, so at the moment we don't really know if it's either friend or foe, we're going to have to be careful with how we handle this he added, before the HUD in his helmet had started beeping. I'll get back to you guys later, something just came up. He cut the transmission shortly after that, and just when he was about to turn around to locate the threat his armor had worn him off, a blur of the color combination of red and blue blur had shot past him much faster than his eyes or any of his cameras could follow. Whoa. Raven's boy said in complete shock as, as the bottom of her cape flew over her head, exposing her leotard. What the heck was that? She asked, properly fixing her cape. I'll give you three guesses. Arsenal said, scowling, while his mask had pulled back revealing a frown on his whiskered face as he pulled up next to Raven. It's red, blue, and it has a great big S in the middle of its chest. He grumbled, and Raven knew whom it was that Naruto was referring to, and a few moments after a few couple of poundings and smashings were heard, said persons had fully revealed themselves, and her conclusion was dead on. Superman, New 52 design, had arrived, and currently, he held the remains of what looked like a utterly destroyed octopus-like robot in his right hand, it was safe to say that it was what she and Naruto had been about to intercept, before he had casually tossed a broken item to Naruto who had caught it rather easily with his own hand, his helmet's mask pulled back over his face, and he activated his M-shielding as it did, so as to hide his identity from the Man of Steel's X-ray vision. I think your team and mine need to have a talk. He, Superman, had said. And since we helped you with that small issue, I think you owe us that much. He added with a tone stating how serious he was. Sorry, but I don't think we do. Arsenal shot back while well, he had activated his telekinesis and using it on the object Superman threw to him to make it levitate on the air, since he had needed to use his two hands. And besides, my team and I already had the situation handled. He added, frowning behind his helmet, but none could see the upset facial expression. Well, you might have handled it if you weren't exactly slow in your execution. Superman calmly retorted, shooting Arsenal a look. I believe that alone says how much the situation was handled. He added, knowing that doing this kind of thing always meant business, and you couldn't always joke with it. You need to be faster than that kid. Lives could have been lost if things had gone south because you weren't fast enough. Hey, the only reason I was slow in the first place was because I was relaying orders to my team. 
Arsenal argued, already starting to grow angry at the Man of Steel and the way he had just seemed to put him down because it had reminded him of the fight with Zabuza Momoichi and how he, just like the Man of Steel was doing at this moment. That put him down at every given chance he had Superman was patronizing him, it was something he disliked. You and your team didn't need to jump in like that, we didn't ask you to. Um, yo Arsenal, just a quick question Cyborg's voice had said, halting Arsenal's tirade. Did you say anything about a certain manhunter popping in and doing our job for us? No Cyborg, no I did not. Arsenal growled, slightly getting angrier with this news. He wanted nothing more than to smack the living daylights out of the smirking man of steel right now, but he held himself, not willing to give in to his anger and further add ammo to the Kryptonian's fuel. He didn't want a repeat of the situation with Zabuza, something that had happened due to how he easily gave in to said anger in the first place. He took a few calming breaths and mentally counted backwards from 10 before he took a final breath and spoke to Cyborg. But at least the drone secure right. He lowly spoke. Looks like it, from what I can tell. Cyborg replied. Would you ask? Because we need to find out what it was after and who sent it in the first place. Arsenal answered, blissfully ignoring the good plan comment from Superman. We still need to determine whether or not it and, if any, its creators are friends or foes, from there we'll plan on how we're going to deal with this, should the situation suddenly escalate from good to bad to worse, for all of that to happen, I need to download any files I can from the drone CPU. With me so far. Yeah, good call by the way. Cyborg said before pausing and then asking, so what now? Now, you and Beast Boy return to the tower with a drone and make sure that it's as secure as it can be when you get there. Arsenal had replied. At the very least, I'll be able to salvage what I'm able to do after studying it. I let Robin and Starfire know that our break is over. But what about? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Arsenal said, already knowing what Cyborg was going to say. You can take him to the tower too, just watch over him until I get there with Mr. Boy Scout over here. He smirked, spotting Superman's angry scowl at the mention of that. Raven and I will see you guys later. Then for Mr. Boss Man, Tin Man is out. Somewhere else. Meanwhile, now known as Zab Yuza Momoichi, the mercenary sent after the arsenal armor, casually sat on an expensive-looking chair, while he casually threw both his legs over an even more expensive-looking table. And in front of him sat a very angry man who looked like a midget with a hairstyle that somewhat resembled an afro, the appearance served to amuse Zab Yuza, even more than the pathetic killer intent the midget poured out and standing on each side of the midget, each with a katana perched on their hips, were two guards each wearing smirks on their faces, while they stared at Zab Yuza. Well Zab Yuza, I'm waiting said the midget. Zabuza quirked up an eyebrow at the sentence. Waiting for what exactly? He asked. Waiting for a good reason not to kill you for failing to perform a very simple task. Kill me? You? Please. Zabuza snorted. You're lucky enough that I let you breathe in my airspace. He said, sneering as the midget had sputtered following his airspace. I offered you money. The midget roared, stabbing his cane at Zabuza's direction. Money that most would kill for in your position. This, this is how you repay me. Meh. Zabuza shrugged. I don't really care about that anymore Gatton. He said, waving his hand dismissively. Besides, I've been offered something else that pays more than whatever you were going to offer me. The midget, now identified as Gatton, glared at Zabuza. Yeah right, there's no one richer than me you pathetic fool. He proudly proclaimed. I'm the world's richest man. Even Lex Luthor, of all people, is jealous of me and my money. There's just no way anyone has more than what I have. Is that what you say to yourself each time you go to bed you freak? Zab Yuza said blankly, staring at Gatton with an expression of equal blankness. I can name at least five people that are richer than you are right now, but right now I won't because I've got better things to do. He stated, getting up from his chair, not caring if it fell behind him as he hopped to the open window of the room. Hey, why? Zab Yuza had jumped out of the window before he could finish Gatton had finished his sentence, free falling down twenty flights. Adam gripped his cane angrily as veins bulged and pulsed on his forehead. That no good pathetic little twerp. He snarled, slapping the tray of wine in front of him away. Does that fool even realize the consequences of his idiocy? He growled. Why not just hire someone stronger boss? Suggested one of the guards, the one to his right. I know of a few people that could get the job done better than that poser. No need. Gadam sighed, before he grinned. I already have someone in mind, someone that's going to help me take care of Zabuza and retrieve the armor. He said as he thought of a certain he knew that was stronger, faster and even smarter than Zab Yuza himself could ever be in this lifetime. He's the best man for the job, that's why I hired him months earlier to help me get rid of a few unwanted annoyances. He explained, before slapping his cane at the guard on the left. You, peon, get me my phone, I believe it's time to make a few calls. 
he needed to tell his man that the parameters of his mission has changed due to undesired circumstances. He needed to get that armor before the end of the year, and he will get that armor. He didn't care of who he has to kill to get to it because in his mind, every casualty was one that got in the way of his business, something he greatly disliked to an extremity. Slade Wilson it looks like we're going to be seeing each other sooner than we originally thought. Gatton thought, smirking, while looking outside the window of his multinational industry. He he, and I do like it when you work for me, at least unlike some people, I know I can trust you to get the job done you always do after all. Titan's Tower. Minutes later. So Arsenal, what do you say? Superman asked. Since you're the leader, the decision is in your hands. He added. Arsenal Naruto crossed his arms over his chest. But if I say yes, then what? The Titans work under the direct supervision of the Justice League with you guys monitoring us like common criminals. He demanded in a tone stating clearly that he didn't like the idea. After what you guys did to one of my teammates, tell me just why exactly I would want my team to work with your short-sighted team. Flash sighed. Listen, back then, Zatanna didn't speak for all of us, and she was just a rookie he tried to say, but he was harshly cut off by Arsenal. Yet you still went ahead and listened to said rookie. Our mistake, I get that, but you have to see it from our point of view Superman spoke up, but like with Flash, he too was cut off. Stop, just stop. Arsenal sighed. It's been nearly an hour since the Justice League comprising of Martian Manhunter, Flash, and Superman had arrived to the tower and got straight up to the meeting, right after the initial visitors tour of the place Flash was greatly impressed and slightly jealous at the setup here as he compared it to what they had in the JL Tower and as the meeting had begun. The first issue to deal with was thanking the Titans for saving the world in their stead from an invasion when they were unavailable to do so. Apparently, the entire team consisting of nine heroes had all been somehow transported to a distant timeline where they had to save a few lives from being lost or it would be the end of the universe as they had known it and yet, despite the team being on said mission for six days as they had counted in their timeline, time had passed for six whole months. Six. Naturally, this brought worry and concern over how the world had fared without them to protect it, and when they had found out that a new team of heroes called the Titans had stepped up in their place, they were relieved and impressed with the way they handled themselves, however to some of the more observant members of the Justice League. Some members of the Titans needed to refine and work on their skills and damage control, and it was no surprise that Superman and Batman were one of the few people who had shared those thoughts, still, most of the Justice League were impressed in general, and some even proposed some form of alliance with the team. It was why the Justice League had sought out an attendance with the Titans in the first place, for their proposal of an alliance. The progress on that? Well. Speaking of said team in question, he had told them to sit this one out after they escorted the three members of the JL on a tour of the tower, while also telling Cyborg to study the drone they had secured so that they could get the answers they needed, while Cyborg did his work. The others watched the meeting as it proceeded via live feed in a different room Arsenal had provided for them however, unlike the rest of her teammates, Starfire, had reported that her presence was required elsewhere, so she needed to step out of the tower for a few minutes, while having a look of giddiness on her face. But that did not stop her from wishing Naruto the best of luck in his proceedings when they took place before she had left. Ugh, this is really starting to get difficult. Superman thought with a sigh while his fingers rubbed the bridge of his nose in an equal amount of frustration, the armored hero in front of him already was starting to display. But he does have a point, knowing how Batman acts and all. He inwardly mused before looking at Arsenal. Look, we're not saying that your team should work under ours, what I'm saying is. I know what you're saying. Arsenal said, cutting off Superman once more. But you still haven't given me a reason I like for both our teams to even consider merging in the first place. He told the Man of Steel. You can't offer us resources, as you can see, because we have all what we need in the tower, at the very most, the only thing your team can offer us is just a little extra manpower. Something you could no doubt eventually need Flash muttered. And I already have a plan for that as we speak, so your help isn't really necessary. Arsenal continued, ignoring Flash's interruption. So I'm asking again, exactly just why should my team join up with yours? John, you haven't said anything yet. Superman said, looking to the green-skinned Martian in question. Don't you have anything in mind to help us change this guy's mind? To be honest, I see no reason for us to even consider convincing this man otherwise. John Johns, the Martian Manhunter, had spoken up after a few moments of silence. Even I can tell that he's dead set on refusing anything we have to offer. He said to Superman, before turning to Arsenal. But consider this, do you not think that if our two teams could combine both our resources and efforts, the lives of the innocents would be saved even more efficiently than before? Arsenal was silent. 
He realized that what the Martian Manhunter said was indeed true, the merit was pretty obvious to anyone who had eyes, he was just too blind to even consider that one answer, because of what happened between the Justice League and Raven. Looks like getting a new armor doesn't exactly make you stronger as a person. He mused to himself, before glancing up at the camera that was recording this live feed for his team to watch. Ray, I know you're watching this I just hope you're not going to stay upset with me for too long. You bring up a very convincing argument. He told the green-skinned superhero not of his team. Makes me wonder just how long you were waiting to say that. Martian Manhunter smiled in response. But I see your point. Arsenal continued. Fine, we'll work together, but only if your team agrees to these conditions his hand was raised up in the sky to hold off any comments he knew would generate the moment he considered agreeing with the Alliance. Number 1. Minutes later. Glad we could come up with some sort of agreement that satisfies both our teams. Superman said, as he, Martian Manhunter, and the Flash all currently had stood inside the teleportation capsules. When you see Raven, please do me a favor and help me apologize on behalf of myself and my team for the way we treated her the first time we both met. He added, while taking the hand of Arsenal and shaking it. I'll try, but don't blame me if she's not as forgiving as you hope, Arsenal told the Man of Steel as he firmly shook his hand. Especially when I just decided to form an alliance with a team that snuffed her out based on a blind magician's assumptions. He finished. Do not worry yourself my armored friend, for I believe that she will understand why you had to follow this path. Martian Manhunter had said, smiling. Flash spoke up. Yeah, listen to the green alien. He said, blitzing to Arsenal's side and throwing his hand over the armored hero's shoulder. You don't need to worry about it, eventually all that anger she'll probably feel will blow over in a few days, give or take. He added, and it'll all be hugs and kisses with you guys. You really don't know who Raven is do you Arsenal stated dryly. Not really. Flash grinned. But from what I can see, she's definitely a female version of our big man bat. Alright, that's enough of that. Superman said, I think it's time we three head back to the Justice League Tower. The Justice League had left shortly after that, and after saying a final goodbye to Arsenal, who stood and waved them off while he watched as their atoms slowly vanished until nothing was left. Great, now to think of a way to explain to Raven why I had to join forces with the Justice League he muttered as he flashed out of his armor and instead into Naruto Senju, who was now wearing a mid-bicep and mid-thigh length under sheath unitard, think of the one Tony Stark wore occasionally in Avengers Assemble at least, I think it is a unitard. If anything, at least my explanations should calm her down I hope. His musings were cut short however, when Ultron's voice spoke up. Recognized, Starfire. 004, guest. 001. He blinked at the second part and saw as Corey seemed to phase into existence following Ultron's announcement, before he looked around for who it was that had arrived with his friend Corey, because all he saw right now was her excited figure. Friend Naruto, look who has paid us the surprise visit. She exclaimed happily. Naruto's eyebrow shot up past his hairlines. Um star there's no one here. He dryly said, before Starfire had floated to the left, revealing a figure who looked strikingly similar to Starfire in looks and figure, the only differences were the outfit she wore, and the color of her hair and eyebrows and finally, her eyes, all of which were dark purple in color. Though and there was the fact that she seemed to use out a more mature and serious air around her, more than Starfire ever did. So um, you going to introduce me? No need, my name's Blackfire. The near lookalike had introduced, floating over towards Naruto. And my charming little sister told me all about you she said, purring. Hmm, but she didn't tell me you were this handsome. She finished, throwing her left hand over Naruto's neck and trailing a line up from his chest to his jaw. Starfire was twitching. Naruto noticed this right away, so he grabbed Blackfire's hand from his cheek and looked at her with a nervous smile on his face. So um, yeah. He started, rather awkwardly. Well then Blackfire, welcome to the Titan's Tower. He finally said, after recovering and pushing her away from him. I'm sure you would like to meet the others. What's the matter? Can't handle a little danger. Blackfire said, beeping up an eyebrow with a sly smile on her face. Naruto snorted, please, I can handle danger toots. He boasts. Oh? The question is whether or not if danger can handle me. Starfire loudly cleared her throat, snapping the attention back to her as she did, and when both her best friend and her sister turned to see her, she had a big smile on her face. Like Naruto said big sister, I do think it is time I introduce you to the rest of the titans. She said, happily. Come, I will lead you to them. I'll catch you later handsome. Blackfire called out with a wink as Starfire pulled her away. Naruto watched as the two leave before he breathed out a sigh of relief he didn't know he was having. Phew, when you told me about your sister Cory, you didn't tell me she was that intense. 
he mutters, throwing both his hands behind his head and folding them, as he walked away from the teleportation platform, while he remembered that one time Starfire had told him about a rather extended family that lived on Tamron. He remembered how she always so fondly spoke of her older sister, Blackfire, but she never gave a complete reveal as to how said older sister really was. He smirked. I think things around here just got a little bit more exciting. Days later. Following the Justice League's departure and Blackfire's introduction to Naruto, Starfire moved on to introduce her sister to the rest of her friends, and as Naruto noted, the others showed a somewhat mixed reaction to Blackfire's appearance. Most were okay with it or presence, while a few others were either distrustful or suspicious of the Titan Tower's new resident. With him and one or two others being amongst the latter following his examination of the drone, which was salvaged from the Justice League by Cyborg and Beast Boy, because from what he had found out, the drones had arrived Earth following a faint trail of a familiar energy. Hemeranian energy. And because the trail was so faint, it was easy to confuse its targeting system, something which he had realized along with the fact that Blackfire and Starfire were the only Tamaranians on Earth, he could think of reasons why Starfire could be targeted, reasons all dating back to the Gordanian invasion. However those reasons would be a moot point because of the one question based on that theory. Why come to Earth now? He knew that the Gordanians had the resources to approach and invade Earth the day he downloaded all the information he could from their ship the day of the invasion. He also knew that if they wanted to mount another invasion to recover their once-before prisoner, they could have done so with more even firepower than before, if they learned from their lesson the last time they had tried to invade, but why would they think of invading Earth a second time over one slave, who happened to be a princess of an entire one planet opposed to their views? Better yet, why would they even waste their resources to mount a second invasion on a planet so far away from their home? It's a conclusion based from that theory which ruled the Gordanians out, and given with how diverse the universe was in alien species, that is if he was counting in the spatial survivability aspect of the Tamaranian race, there were an infinite amount of species and organizations that could have sent the drone. So scratching that one species of aliens out didn't exactly narrow down his search list. He still had an unknown amount of alien species to cross out, something that could take him a lot of time. He needed that time for his inventions. And speaking of inventions, if anything, Naruto could confidently say that he really outdid himself with his latest suit arsenal suit. He could not only confidently say that the current version of his arsenal suit was the best and most diverse in terms of functionality and adaptability, thanks to the bonding elements used to create the metallic coating alloy of his suit, now logically known as the Bleeding Edge 1. Zero suit because of the relation it had with his biology. And he could also say that he now had access to an all-new set of powers, all of them originating from a rather diverse ability branch. Magnetokinesis, his study, knowledge and understanding of the NTH element component of his suit, is how he knew this, and it was his curiosity on the subject of why the Wakandans held the element so close to their chest that sparked said study. But enough about him for now, and back to his team and his tower's new resident, Blackfire. She was every bit the opposite of her sister from his observations, and from what he noted, she seemed to try hard to get the entire team to like her and trust her, doing and showing at least a bit of knowledge or two in any of the things they liked. Making some of them compare her to her younger sister in that aspect. Naruto was upset with that. He was upset with how his teammates were unknowingly pushing Starfire away and slowly replacing her role with her sister at two. Zero-like version of Starfire is what he had heard Beast Boy, and on some occasions, Cyborg, whisper from time to time because of this, Starfire was upset. He easily noted how upset she had looked, despite her trying to hide it whenever she was around her friends and her sister, and he also saw the spark of jealousy in her jade green eyes, and from time to time, sorrow, jealousy, no doubt, was aimed at her sister, and the sorrow accompanied with a look of longing, was aimed at her friends, because of this. He decided to comfort Starfire in her time of need. Starfire appreciated it, and if possible the bond between them had gotten stronger within the few days that had passed, while the growing feelings she had had increased tenfold. Raven was displeased with this as she noted how closer Naruto and Starfire had gotten, but after taking a look at Blackfire, she quickly understood why it needed to be done, it's why she had not made a fuss of the situation as of yet, besides, unlike some of the others on the team, she didn't really seem to like Blackfire and how desperate the Tamaranian had looked trying to get into her good books, and she didn't like how her friend's older sister always flirted with her best friend. It was why she rarely ever participated in any of the extracurricular activities Blackfire hosted, and it was also why she had mostly avoided the newest resident of the Titan's Tower. She was also a little bit upset with Naruto, but even she knew that she couldn't stay upset with him forever. She knew Naruto wasn't the one who was at fault with the way the date had just abruptly ended, but she also knew that he didn't have to end it the way he had done so, he could have just ignored the drone and continued on with just spending time with her, time which she enjoyed. 
However she knew if he had done that then lives could have been lost and it would be because of her selfishness and she didn't want that. She didn't want to be the daughter her father always wanted. She wanted to be the opposite and of all people, Naruto knew that it was one of the few reasons she chose to be a hero in the first place. It was also why she reluctantly chose to share him with Starfire, if it ever came to that she had realized through meditation that she was slowly giving in to her negative emotions, with her obsessiveness over her best friend, something she didn't want, and she didn't want to destroy friendships because she was obsessive and selfish. She didn't want to hurt anyone because she completely gave in to her negative emotions and lost control of her powers. She wasn't her father's daughter. Present. Naruto stood on one of the corners within his bedroom, currently gazing at the wide communication screen in front of him, and the image that was staring right back at him was that which belonged to one Ino Yamanaka. A beautiful young a fair-skinned girl of average height with a pair of blue eyes, a long, pale blonde hair, which currently is in a hip-length ponytail with bangs covering the right side of her face and a thoughtful expression on her face. She was one of Naruto's best friends, one which entered his life a few months after Raven's sudden departure, which was a few months before his father's death. She, along with Shikamaru and his friend Choji, had been with him from back when he had started the whole arsenal business a few moments after the accident, which gave him a battery-type heart, and for a long time, she had been there for him, especially when he really needed emotional support or otherwise, as long as it was within her speciality range. Which was mostly interrogation and gossip, and she's also his current girlfriend. Raven didn't know this, and originally, Naruto had no intention of telling her about Ino, because he was worried about how she'd react if he told her, he knew that she would start demanding answers as to when and how this happened, and why, and in all honestly he wasn't sure if he was ready to give out those answers yet back then at least, why? Because Ino had been around to slowly fix up the void of distrust, sadness and loss he had following Raven's departure and his father's death, it may have taken time, but thanks to her, Shikamaru and Chaoji's presences, along with that of his legally adopted older sister. Tsunade, who had been absent for quite some time because of a few important issues, he's now able to trust someone again, much like he was able to do before. He trusted them more than he trusted the Titans and his reunited friend, Raven, despite he and her repairing the relationship they once had, but he wasn't going to just forget all the years he had cried because of her in a few months. Things don't work like that, and also Cory who had only been in his life for a few months, less than the many years his friends back home had been in his life, and none of the Titans knew about Eno, not even Raven and Starfire. Naruto knew that if he didn't want any issues between his life in Jump City and his life at Tokyo, he was going to have to let Raven and maybe Starfire know about Eno and what she meant to him, Eno however, she knew all about the Titans since day one, she knew about their secret identity and their strengths and weaknesses, as he had mentioned it once before, in the past it is, and as usual. She had always stated how jealous and upset she was that Naruto had gone and formed another team which seemed more awesome than Team Arsenal. Eno, how many times are you gonna make me say it? I'm not gonna peek which team is better than whose. Naruto sighed, even if I did, Team Arsenal had an unfair advantage, since we have been working together years longer than the Titans. He explained, thinking back to the five years he, Ino and Shika had spent together facing off very dangerous villains which Japan had offered, he even remembered the time he had to face the Japanese government, who thought, and still think, he's a threat. By the way, how's Shikamaru handling the cover-up thing we agreed on? He asked, as he recalled how he, Shika and Ino had come up with a plan to keep the hero arsenal in business, even if he had left the country. You know how Shika is. Ino responded, waving off Naruto's concern. It's always troublesome this and troublesome that she had stated, putting air quotes at the two times she'd said troublesome. But don't worry about him, he can handle whatever's thrown at him, thanks to all those new upgrades to his armor, even though at first he was a bit reluctant to do the job you left for him. It's a good thing we took care of the Mandarin before any of this. Naruto muttered with a frown on his face as he mentioned the word Mandarin. Lord knows that Shikamaru is not skilled enough to handle him. Still not able to find out where or who the Mandarin is. Naruto shook his head at Ino's question. No, and that's what worries me. He told Ino, looking up at her face. I know I was able to destroy some of the Makluin rings, however he still has a couple of them left, and even with one, we both know how dangerous was, I swear, the only good thing about this is that he's... Ultron's voice cut in, interrupting whatever Naruto was going to say. Mr. Senju, my sensors picked up a large trace of dark matter heading towards the metahuman prison grounds it said, and as Naruto heard it, his hand went through a couple of motions while he still stood in front of the screen on his wall. The image of Eno had shrunk into a small square and shifted to one corner of the screen. As a larger screen had appeared. I'll call you back Eno. Naruto told his girlfriend once he saw just exactly what was going on before he pressed his hands to his ear. Titans, as I'm speaking to you at this moment, there's about to be a break-in at Iron Heights. 
I need you guys to gear up, I'll meet you there. Ultron's voice cut in again, once more interrupting Naruto's voice. Sorry to interrupt sir, but an explosion just went off at Project Cadmus facility. Correction, you guys head off to Iron Heights, I need to quickly head off to Cadmus to put out a fire and save any lives in danger. Naruto said to the communication device in his ear, as he flashed into his arsenal suit and walked towards the two glass doors that lead to the balcony hanging outside the room. I'll catch up with you guys as soon as I can. He took off shortly after he cut the transmission. Project Cadmus. Moments later. He had arrived at the facility faster than any firefighters would have done so, and as he got there, he saw that the fire had spread faster than he had assumed in such a short amount of time which caught him off guard, but Naruto wasn't deterred by this however, so he immediately went to work. Which he had started by transforming, or shapeshifting, each repulsor cannon built on his two palms into small portholes, after he had stopped a few meters away from the building, and aiming said two palms, after he'd spread them in front of him, towards the fire, think water hazard from Ben 10 Ultimate Alien. Once he did that, the flames started to vacuum towards into the two holes, with the fumes escaping through a third and fourth hole located on each of his elbows, a murmuring crowd already gathered below him, pointing and talking amongst each other, and amongst this crowd was the media. Who were filming and reporting as Arsenal put out the flames, as the firefighters were arriving to the chaos, and he stayed in that position for a few more moments, that is at least until the flames had completely disappeared, thus eliminating any possibility of spreading into the city causing more chaos. Naruto could hear the crowd cheer his hero name down below. He ignored it and instead, without consulting Ultron, he switched his vision mode to infrared, scanning for any heat signature that could have been injured or trapped during the fire outbreak. Two life signatures, and from what it looks like, they're both uninjured. He mentally said, as he was scanning the building. Good. He added. Looks like everyone his sentence had trailed off as his scanners picked up more than two heat signatures further levels down below the two he had spotted, and it seems that they were all completely fine and very calm, despite the very recent fire outbreak. On second thought, it looks like I'll leave those two to the firefighters, because it looks like it's time I perform a little investigation. He thought, turning to the firemen below him and levitating down towards them. Hey, thanks for helping us out man, you don't know how many lives you've saved by putting out the fire faster than we could. One of the firemen had said once they had seen Arsenal hover in front of them. Don't worry about it. Arsenal responded, waving off their thanks. I'm sure you guys would have done the same thing I did if I hadn't shown up on time. One fireman replied, yeah, but not as fast as you hero types would have done it. He looked yonder and saw his partners bursting out of the building with two workers, who seemed to be a bit charcoal but otherwise okay. I wish I had superpowers like you guys did, or at least had a suit of armor with awesome feats, it would sure make my work easier. He muttered quietly, but Arsenal was close enough to hear him. You guys don't need superpowers, you're doing fine without them. Arsenal stated, before turning around and flying towards the building, just as the reporters were able to make their way towards him. Well, take care, I need to see if anyone was hurt, I'll radio you guys if I don't see anyone in the building. He said, before disappearing into the Project Cadmus building a few feet in front of him. He was completely unaware that amongst the crowd of people in front of Project Cadmus, someone had slipped away and into the recently flaming building, when everyone was distracted with one thing or the other, what this person wanted, no one knew. Inside Project Cadmus. Moments later. Arsenal had given the all clear to the fireman a few seconds following his entrance into the Project Cadmus building, however as he had done so, he had spotted something strange taking the service elevator, suggesting that a third person, or thing, was on the upper levels of the building. Something that would be completely strange since his scanning vision had only picked up two heat signatures. Honestly, that shouldn't be strange at all. Arsenal stated quietly to himself, as he recalled spotting the lower levels with his scanning vision, and more heat signatures, right along with said lower levels. What's strange is that there's 52 sub-levels in a two-story building, and what's more is the fact that there's someone or something trapped on one of the floors he muttered, as he punched a few squares on the hologram displayed image on his gauntlet. And I can't get anything up here. He sighed, before walking up to the express elevator doors, which he then forced open with his enhanced strength, and he saw how deep the elevator's pathway was once he was done. No time like the present. He said to himself, before taking a step forward and jumping, dropping down at speeds increasing with each floor he passed. Switching vision to infrared. He had thought, waiting as his vision switched modes, and waiting and watching, as the angle of his descent slowly reached the X-viewing angle of the room, where his scanning vision was seeing the heat signature of the still-struggling victim, after said modes had switched. 
he was about to activate his thrusters, but then he had stopped as he realized that they would make too much noise, so he instead, he called upon his telekinesis and wrapped himself with a telekinetic force blanket, which he had control over, before he gently lowered himself down on the air. Slowly but finally reaching his designated floor with his vision switching back from the infrared to his normal human vision as he'd done so, and after channeling his technokinesis, which he used to bypass the security and the motion sensors, he then forced the elevator doors in front of him open, with his two hands. Um, Arsenal glanced around, spotting different hallways in front of him as he forced open the elevator doors and noting that only one lead to his destination. Better leave a message to let the others know that I'm going to be a bit late. He mutters, ignoring as the elevator doors automatically slammed shut behind him as he placed his two legs on the ground in front of him and started to walk down the hallway on his right, while turning invisible. And at an unknown amount of time and in a different wing which was far from where Arsenal currently was investigating, a man in a lab coat was currently working on perfecting what seemed to be a serum, and behind him stood a silhouette, which belonged to a seemingly muscular male figure, it was currently watching the man in the lab coat's progress from the shadows. Well Dr. Desmond, I'm waiting said the figure in the shadows, and meanwhile Desmond, as the male in the lab coat was now known as, flinched at the sudden sound originating from behind him. The doctor's normal reaction would have been to snap at anyone that dared showed him this disrespect, anyone who had a certain object on their shoulder, however, not only did this man not have the compulsory device for all workers under the sub-level facility he currently ran. Desmond also knew whom it was currently that observing him work neither was he stupid nor he blind, metaphorically speaking of course, as he knew that the man behind him, the same one he now faced, would take him out before he could even flinch, should he try anything against him. In any form and he wasn't strong or fast enough to take out a well-known assassin who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Batman and win, he also knew how closely knitted the man is to the light, his superiors, something that was very bad for him in the long run, should word eventually reach out of his failed assassination. Desmond cleared his throat and loosened up his tie. Mr. Deathstroke, you have to be more patient. He stated sternly. Creating an enhancing formula key to one's genetic code isn't as easy as it. Is my serum ready, Dr. Desmond? Well, technically speaking, it is. Desmond stuttered a bit, fixing his glasses, before walking over to one of the many storage pipes in the room. As I was trying to say before you interrupted me, the serum needs to be stored in a cool environment for a few hours for its effects to bring about more results than the current results provided. He explained, moving over to the vault he had stored the serum and grabbing said serum from said cooling vault before walking over and handing it to Deathstruck. Deathstruck hummed as he closely observed the serum now in his hands as he brought the veil up to his face before looking back at the sweating man in front of him. Do I look like a fool Dr. Desmond? He asked, glancing back at the serum in his hands before throwing it back to the doctor who fumbled before he finally caught it. Tested. I need to make sure the serum you made works without any side effects. How? The serum is key to your DNA, if I have any test subjects that have not even a single trace of it, they die. Then you can use this, and remember, I expect pleasing results Dr. Desmond. Deathstrick said, bringing out a veil of what looked to be blood from his utility belt and handing it over to Desmond, who glanced at the blood in the vial with a somewhat unsure look on his face. Well, doctor. Desmond gulped before he walked over to his experimenting table which held the equipments needed. Fine, fine, I'll do what you want. He muttered, scowling. Just make sure you have the rest of my payment ready and upfront Mr. Deathstruck by the time we're done with all of this. Of course. Deathstruck calmly said, slowly reaching into one of the many utility pouches on his belt. If this does indeed work as you claim it does, I'll make sure you get your just deserts. So after that, Cyber just left. Yeah, he said he quits the team, we haven't seen or heard from him since, Beast Boys tried calling him, but he's not picking up any of his calls. Hmm, as upsetting as this all is, I'm very sure Cyborg's alright. I can still pick up the signal from his Titan's ID card and his Titan-issued hologram generator, if I can do that, then that means he's not out of the team just yet, or else, he would have had his card on him if that were the case at least. Maybe he forgot to get rid of it. The Titan's ID card, maybe, but if he were indeed quitting for real, he would have disconnected his wrist gauntlet because he knows that I can track him wherever he is on this planet, with that thing on. So like I said, don't worry about it, you'll definitely see him again. Alright I'll take your word for it. Cool and I'll be sure to have a word with Blackfire when I get back. Over and out. Arsenal cut the transmission shortly after that, calmly walking down the somewhat busy hallway with his orange lenses still on its infrared viewing mode. He still couldn't believe how easy it was to sneak past all those monsters and scientists and security, he saw well technically speaking he could believe it, because he was the one who built and programmed the stealth part of the suit, his brilliance is actually what made his stealth mode as awesome as it was, awesome in all sense of the word, because. 
Not only could he turn invisible to the naked eye with it, not only could his invisibility affect radars of any kind by cloaking his heat signature, he could also phase through solid objects effortlessly, literally it made him a ghost. But concerning this mission so far, with the stealth mode, he was able to spy on just what it was Project Cadmus is really up to, and what he had found out it had him cursing whoever was that's running Cadmus to the lower pits of hell and back, it also helped explain just why who, or what it was, he saw with his infrared vision was struggling the way they did. And I bet when they do find out, the Justice League aren't going to like this one bit he thought. Especially him. The gnomes, living weapons, cloning, the enhancements, the memory wiping everything was just so surreal, so overwhelming, yet it wasn't so shocking as it was supposed to be to him because of the world he was currently living in, however, as he thought back to the one thing that was linked to all of this this mess. He couldn't help but clench his right hand as well as grit his teeth in anger, while his eyes flashed with rage. Project MN. If his girlfriend, Eno, were here, she'd rant about the immorality of all of this, and if the other Titans were here, they'd no doubt charge into the situation once they found out about this entire business, this entire situation, and destroy the facility, much like how he wanted to do so right now, as his blue eyes stared at the pod containing what seemed to be a green-skinned bald-headed female figure who seemingly appears to be in her late teens from the information he picked up, the solar suit she currently wore, constantly absorbed yellow sun radiation and stored them into her cells 24-7. You don't deserve to live like this. He thought angrily, while his hands clenched in an equal amount, recalling the numerous reports on the experiments performed on her. What right do these people have to do something so grotesque? She's quite the work of art isn't she? A calm voice asked from behind him, making Arsenal completely freeze in shock. They say her pod was found at Star Labs the night of the particle accelerator incident, if I were to wager a guess, I'd say she's the reason lives were sent to the hospital that night interesting don't you think? No freaking way. I have to congratulate you for making it this far all on your own. Arsenal twisted his body to face the source of the voice. For you to do so without alerting any of the security, well I have to say, I'm impressed, more so at the arsenal at your disposal. Arsenal saw a body suddenly form out of nothing. I guess that's why you decided to call yourself Arsenal, that's quite clever if you ask me, but it's also quite redundant. Scanning scanning match found. Name. Slade Wilson. Alias. Deathstruck. An assassin for hire. Wanted for different counts of murders, homicides, assaults, multiple types of theft, and arson. Brett Level. S. Warning. A concentrated amount of dark matter energy found within the vicinity. Proceed with caution. Those were the readings displayed on his HUD screen once Arsenal mentally ordered his onboard scanners to scan the man in front of him, and if he was worried about the results, Arsenal didn't show it on his face, despite the fact that it was hiding behind a helmet, though he was more concerned about the fact that his scanners weren't able to pick up a trace of this man. That is until now of course, and he was also concerned about the fact that this man seemed to spot him despite the fact that he was as cloaked as a chameleon could be. There's no point in hiding anymore boy, I already know you're here. The male now identified as Slade, Deathstruck, said rather calmly, with his two hands folded behind him. The metallic scent your suit gives out is quite unique after all. So that's how he did it. Arsenal thought in realization, as his stealth mode wore of revealing his armored self to Deathstruck. Looks like I'm going to have to do something about that then, if this armor is supposed to be as stealthy as I want it to be. He mentally concluded with a TSK and a small frown. Fine, you managed to figure out that I'm here. I've got my own things to say like for instance, why are you here? He asked. Even I can see that question answers itself. Deathstruck replied, his voice cool. I'm not letting you put your slimy hands on her. Arsenal snarled, aiming his two palms at Deathstruck. Deathstruck remained silent for a few moments as he stared at Arsenal, before he finally spoke. And just exactly how are you going to prevent me from getting what I want? He asked. You have no idea of what I can and cannot do, but you see, I've been studying you and your team for quite some time now. He said. In fact, as we speak right now inside this block, three of my men are facing your teammates, defeating them at this moment. You Arsenal breathed in realization as he heard that last part. You're the one that sent that rock guy to Iron Heights. Brilliant deduction. Deathstruck said in a mocking congratulating tone as he clapped his hands also in a mocking gesture. Yes, I indeed did send Cinderblock to Iron Heights, however his mission had two parts, both of which he performed them quite admirably if I might add. You needed me away from my teammates. Arsenal said, frowning deeply as he read the situation at hand. That's why you started the fire here, at Cadmus. Good, you're not as dull as I originally thought. Deathstruck easily commented. Even though I am saddened that it did take you this long to figure all this out. He stated, while well, bringing up a small tablet which showed the Titans, minus Blackfire, fighting a losing battle with Cinderblock and two new players. 
As you can clearly see, your teammates are currently fighting a losing battle with three of my men. The purple one is called Plasmus, and the sandy-looking fellow decided to name himself Shukaku. Deathstruck explained. On their own, both can be extremely dangerous, however when they're working together with Cinderblock and my control chips, they're an unstoppable force my unstoppable force. Deathstruck had played his hand very, Arsenal knew that, just as he also knew, as he watched all of his teammates fight Plasmus, Cinderblock and Shukaku, that this hand was a tough one to beat, what Deathstruck didn't know however, was that the Titans were fighters, and would always remain standing strong no matter what. They can take care of themselves. He mentally concluded. They're strong and smart enough to handle themselves with those three. He thought. And I'm sure Cyborg will eventually come around and help them off their feet. My team can take care of themselves. Arsenal sternly said in a firm voice. If you think you can blackmail me with their lives, then you clearly underestimate how strong the Titans can be when the situation calls for it. He proclaimed, before he pressed a singular surface on his right gauntlets, and as he did, six duplicates of him in his arsenal armor, had suddenly flashed by his side three on his left, and three on his right. Oh, and say hello to a new feature I added in my suit Deathstruck, compliments to Billy Numerous. Deathstruck remained silent at the comment and didn't twitch a single muscle as he saw the clones appear next to Arsenal, instead his one single eye simply glanced around as he observed the situation before him with a critical eye, before he finally spoke up. My, my, he said, trailing off into a drawl. Aren't we full of surprises today? He softly spoke as he was glancing at the original Arsenal while folding both his two arms behind him while putting away his tablet. But if you're trying to intimidate me, you're going to have to do better than this. Who said all this was to try and intimidate you? Arsenal asked before pointing at Deathstruck, causing the clones to charge at the assassin in response to this action. Deathstruck got into his fighting stance as he saw the clones charging at him. Looks like I'm going to need to educate you in the pointlessness of all this is. He stated, before charging at the clones with his right arm beat back in a fist and then throwing said fist at the first clone he reached. Arsenal immediately went to work, as he had seen that his clones had now kept Deathstruck as busy as he wanted the assassin to be, by bringing his right hand towards his chest, before he started to type on the 2D hologram which had popped up. He was working as fast as he could in getting the door of the containment in front of him open, by using his computers to hack the internal servers of the systems controlling the pod, and as he did that, he then quickly disabled the security protocol that did the job of alerting the guards that someone was about to steal their projects, or that the project itself was getting free. He looked at the pod once he had done that part, and he was hesitant to follow through the next step because of the chunk of kryptonite sitting on the opposite side of the door, it was what gave the pod that hypnotic green glow, and he found out about it thanks to the files he had downloaded however. Once he remembered that he wore a suit which protected him from any type of radiation infection or poisoning, especially the kryptonite type, he reached for any ledges he could grab and tightened his fingers around it before he grunted and literally ripped out the containment door from its hinges and tossed the door in his hands away from him and the subject. He gazed at the slumbering form laying in the pot in front of him, his HUD screen scanning and beepizing her as he took a few paces forward, but then he stopped and suddenly leaned his head right, narrowly avoiding the hand that would have grabbed him from the back of his head, had he not moved as quickly as he did, while charging a repulsor cannon on his right gauntlet as he did so. He then grabbed the stretched hand as it was about to withdraw, pulled the body towards him, and placed his repulsor charged hand on Deathstruck's shocked face. Boom. His cannon fired in a clean sweep, a blue beam of energy blasted into Deathstruck's body as it did, sending said assassin's body sailing across the room and crashing into the furniture's and wall behind it, and as he placed his hands by his side, his HUD flashed a red alert, causing him to swiftly turn around, however he reeled back in surprise at what he saw. The green eyes of Project MN staring right back at him. End chapter. So this part ends here. If you want to see next part of this series. Like the video now, and share the story with your friends. Bye bye.